I'd like to ask our panelists, uh, including yourself, I hope, Alberto, to uh, to join us. Um, if you do have access to video, that would be great. Um, it helps uh, helps connect with our with our audience. If not, then uh, we'll just come to you on on audio. Um, so we have a panel of uh, everyone who's spoken uh, in the second second half here, um, which is uh, which is great stuff. So. I'm going to kick off, we've got a, a number of questions here, so I'm going to kick off with one for, um, I think this, I'm going to maybe aim this at you to start with, Joel, if I may, um, since it came in while you were, you were talking, but uh, <clears throat> the question is, by introducing heuristics, does this not make it a quantitative rather than a quantitative model of risk assessment? If so, how will the subjectivity impact security metrics and organizational security? I guess I would need to understand before approaching that where heuristics was introduced. That may actually, I may have misspoken. That may have actually been um, uh, Mike and Bob's presentation then. Okay. I believe so. Um, the, the, uh, the introduction of heuristics, unless everyone is denying introducing heuristics to the mix. Um, <laughs> but I guess it came from somewhere. That might have been in reference, Joel, to the, the risk matrices in your presentation. Right. Okay, so I guess in that regard, I would say, you know, what I was trying to do was take something that had been derived using heuristics, the, the matrix itself and from it deriving something that could then be used to apply the results of an open fair analysis against it so if it was interpreted that i was introducing heuristics as a <laughs> suggestion i i would want to certainly um uh, correct that uh, and make sure no what i may have been talking about was the fact that a lot of those risk matrices that are in, in, in wide use from uh, risk management organizations are often developed using those kinds of uh, methods and approaches and what I was trying to introduce is a, a way to approach those to extract a range from it that could then be used uh, consistently when reporting the ALE numbers. But it was certainly not my intent to suggest introducing heuristics into, into that process. Right. Okay. No, nope. fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's move on. So is, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, do you have any, this This is uh, open to to anyone, but certainly those who've, who've been using open fair in uh, inside organizations in their practice, any suggestions for how to introduce or make the case for the introduction of open fair in my organization? Yeah, how do you, how, how might you go about uh, getting your organization to, uh, to consider using something that they're not currently using like this for such an important topic? I'll I'll take a, a swing at this to start the, off the conversation, Steve. Uh, Thank you. What I've what I've seen done successfully and, and participated in is uh, simply you know one approach is simply taking the output of a of, of a quantitative model, uh, specifically something like a loss exceedance curve, and, and showing it to a would be champion. And in, in, in one case, it was the VP of enterprise risk who had been searching and uh, for a better approach to assessing risk in the enterprise to to understanding, uh, you know, decision making under, under uncertainty and, and really very simply to apply dollars to risk. And those are his terms. He goes, I finally as he, as he saw fair and, and, and as, as saw fair used. He, he, his, his comment to, to the team was, we, we finally have a way to assign dollars to risk, which, which in, a, in a healthcare environment was, was the exception to the rule. So, um, the, 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 you know, that, that is one approach or one tactic that you can use is, is show them this is what we can get from FAIR and, and probabilistic modeling in general. Uh, and, and, and let that speak for itself. And, and, and with that, if I could just add a little bit more is, is definitely look for a champion. Look for an executive level champion that's going to help you carry that flag. Because especially if you're an analyst or someone six or seven layers deep in an org chart, that that's an uphill battle. Right. That's 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 good advice. 
if, if I may kind of take that one step further, once you've done that and shown them that you can do it in dollars, approach I've taken at several different organizations is specifically around allocation of resources. And the idea of if you show them that loss exceedance curve and you say, listen, if you treat this as an $80 million risk, just you know, to, to use a number, that is a possible possibility, but it may in fact be, you know, in the 99th percentile. So while talking in terms of, well, it's possible this could be, you know, an $80 million risk, that's true. But when you show them the rest of the loss exceedance curve and say, you know, it is most likely, you know, 95% of the values are going to be $10 million or less. The difference in that is how to how I have you know, approached quickly showing them a return on investment with the ev investment of doing the quantitative risk. The return on your investment is if you treat this as an $80 million risk and then apply resources as if it were an $80 million risk versus treating it as a $10 million risk, the amount of resources you're going to allocate, allocate that difference there is, is, is a quick way. So, you know, that first showing of how it can be communicated in dollars. And then to me, kind of that next step is then quickly showing him the return on an investment from doing the analysis work and stop treating things as, you know, again, if you're doing 10,000 Monte Carlo simulations, the one out of 10,000 <laughs> result versus where, you know, 95% of the results end up. Okay, thank you, Joe. So, Bob, did you have something to, to add? Yeah, I was just going to add to the two, two, uh, two comments is that if we're talking about a financial institution, let's say a bank, open fair fits perfectly into the framework because number one you have to quantify the risk in terms of some percentile let's say the 99th percentile as mike and i showed you have to also use the average amount of loss and subtract one versus the other that's the capital number as we described and it's necessary that those numbers be calculated because we're calculating this for the other risks, the market risk and the credit risk. So it fits perfectly into the banking framework. It's something that the regulators would accept as a model, as long as the model is made transparent. And the model is made transparent in terms of the assumptions built in. You know, if you're talking about running a certain number of Monte Carlo simulations, it also has certain nice features to it which is not just only looking at the 99th percentile or some percentile, you also can calculate the risk in the, in the tail. And that calculation of the risk in the tail or the expected risk in the tail is the way the regulatory apparatus in banking is going to. So it has all the nice features that you would otherwise want, and it does integrate well with the other types of risks. I would add, Somebody mentioned that it also impacts risks like strategic risk and reputational risk and so on. So it also allows, once you calculate the operational risk for which cyber is, it allows you to project that risk into other risks using the quantitative framework that, that fits well. So I'll stop there. It just works well is the point. Great. Thank you, Bob. And I think I'll add one more point to it. I think the question was, you know, how to introduce uh, quantitative analysis, and I think that it gets down to how does the organization make decisions, and I think there are different decision modes and models that uh, senior executives and boards use. Uh, one of them is centered around command, control, and compliance, where you have something like uh, checklists and policies and procedures to follow, and you want to audit against those. Another kind of decision-making framework is around quantitative economic analysis that requires different data collected than uh, controls and compliance, uh, or command control and compliance. The, so this starts out by, being, by analyzing or looking at how does the organization make decisions or how does the organization aspire to make decisions and then uh, tell, influence the senior leaders there that you have to, your organization has to produce the right kind of information to support the decision style that you've committed to make. And I think if you start there, you have a solid foundation for harmonizing how the organization produces it, knowledge or information in the 
way that the organization wants to consume it in making business decisions. Great, thank you, Mike. Just a, a compliment in terms of experience. Uh, uh, we are using a kind of agile techniques, not to introduce everything at the same time, but really to, to do a kind of sprints that can be weekly or two weeks sprints, and they have a list of a kind of a backlog of different risk scenarios. And in using this big list of risk scenarios identified, we can select the, the scenarios that are most relevant. And so begin doing a kind of a life cycle of uh, risk management of each of the scenarios. So we can have a big panel with this different backlog of scenarios and the, each of the scenarios have different kinds of uh, moments in terms of the steps of the risk managers. I think this agile approach can help to introduce something new um, because we, we are with the, the, the airplane flying and we have to do these changes in the middle of the process that they have already exist in the organizations. Right, absolutely. No, that's, that's very true. Great. Okay, thank you. I think we've got that one done. So, <clears throat> Bob, you referred to this this question in your in your answer that um, uh, I think we should uh, we should we should address it specifically. Um, the uh, question is uh, in the example that, uh, that that Bob and Mike were were talking about. Cyber risk is taken as being applied to operational risk, but there are, it has other dimensions like long term strategy. Can you can you comment on the use of uh, on of open fair for things like long term strategy or other dimensions other than operational risk. Maybe I'll try I'll try to give a quick answer to that, Steve. I, I, I'll give you um, the case where we that Ray Rock example risk adjusted return on capital is a very important calculation. It's not an academic discussion. So we would use that Ray Rock to make a decision to enter a business or reject a business or that kind of thing. So you can imagine a business where you're very vulnerable and the cyber risk is large. In that case, if you reject that business, then you are rejecting a strategic approach that you may otherwise want to take. And those strategic approaches are reviewed on a regular basis. So you might think of it at both a tactical level and a strategic level. So it links very nicely. You fail the risk adjusted return on capital calculation, you just don't penetrate that business. And these are both a priori discussions before you enter a, a, a business and then exports, how is the business uh, performing? So the link is, is, is nicely aligned. Okay, thank you. Anyone else got a comment on uh, use other than for operational risk? Only that is, as Bob and I have worked together, what you see more and more is that risk is risk. It, it's, oh, I mean, different specialties uh, analyze it a little bit differently under different assumptions and maybe using different models, but the fundamental concepts behind it tend to stay the same. And that lets FAIR be used in these different contexts with relatively few modifications. Right. Okay, thank you. All right, um, since this is actually about uh, what's in the standard, uh, I might come to you with this one initially, John, um, John Linford. Um, why is it that open fair differs in its definition of risk from ISO 31000, which allows for a positive deviation from what is expected? I'll take the first cut at that, yeah. Uh, I mean, really what we see with open fair when we're talking about risk I mean, in the definition, it's probable frequency and probable magnitude of loss. So to try to have it also talk about potential benefit with that being the definition gets maybe a little bit weird. Um, we've done some thought experiments before kind of trying to adapt the risk tree to look at it from like an opportunity side. So rather than a loss event frequency, it was some sort of benefit frequency. Um, Nothing really ever came of that just due to, to differences in opinions and approach and sort of assumptions about how it might be used. Um, but really, the point is that if you're going to be using this for risk analyses, you want to be talking about it from the same context 
Right. So if you're always looking at it from loss, not loss or benefit, then when you know you use the word risk, you know exactly what conversation you're having. Great, thank you. Just, just to complement, because we, we are having in ISO internally yeah. a big discussion about the thing because some committees uh, like quality and they change a little the definition of ISO 31000 using just the effect on, on objective, um, uh, the effect of uncertainty. So they cut on objective, but we can uh, think about the objects that can be everything, not a strategic objective, but also, for instance, in case of security, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And so we are have this opposition between uh, risk and opportunity, but uh, we theoretically uh, prefer to consider risk at the top, and we can have threats and opportunities. Because if we apply open fair instead of loss event, like a, a benefit event, for instance, and instead to reduce the risk, in some situation you have to, to increase the risk because this is, you want to increase benefits. What is interesting that open fair applies uh, perfect in this situation too. Great, great, good to hear. Okay, thank you. Uh, move along. I think this one is probably a good place for you to start, Joel, if uh, if we can. Uh, what advice would you give to a risk analyst in an organization that implements controls based on compliance rather than measurable risk reduction? In a couple of frameworks, I do know that the decision to do something is often predicated on a risk analysis having been performed. So this is where, depending on the thing you're complying with, it will be very important to understand if it is literally telling you you must do these things ex exactly as stated, or if it's telling you here are some things to do based on a risk analysis. Um, because over the course of my career, um, I have seen compliance organizations fail to read the fine print, so to say, and they just basically take the laundry list of controls as a go-do order. Um, and in fact, you know, again, upon closer reading, it's, you know, based upon a, you know, risk analysis or risk assessment, however they phrase it in that particular framework, here are some things to do. Um, so really, the first place I start is know the thing you're complying with and know it well. Don't just automatically gravitate to the laundry list of controls because it's easier to just, you know, run around with a list of 25 things to do um, than it is to maybe do a mature risk analysis to be able to make the case of, we're not going to do this thing. And here's our risk analysis that shows why it's a perfectly uh, reasonable risk to accept. It's a little harder. I mean, you know, doing good, mature risk analysis as a part of a risk management is frankly harder to do than just you know chasing a, a laundry list of controls so yeah my, my first piece of advice based on how i understood the question was just if your uh, list is predicated upon a risk analysis implement open fair and actually take that approach before going off and just doing the things that the the, the framework says um, in some cases, it may be a law where, you know, risk analysis is, is a moot point, you know, you must do these things, um, but it's probably not going to be all of those things uh, that you have to do uh, if you can, again, reasonably show why you didn't. It, it, it typically becomes when a company isn't doing something, there's no risk analysis behind it. There's no reason behind why they didn't do it, where a risk analysis can show you that path of, you know, we chose to accept that risk and here's the analysis that led us to that conclusion. Oh, that makes sense. Uh, I don't know of any compliance framework that would expect you to go and lose money on, you know, if, if, if you're showing there's really no risk here, well, we don't care. You have to go do those things anyway. I mean, that's, they may be out there. I haven't read them all, but the ones I've read have all been based on risk analysis. Thank you. Great job. Steve, if I might, if I might yeah. add just to sort of compliment what was just said in a financial institution, a compliance might be, I have to have a minimum amount of regulatory capital to operate in a certain business. So I have to check, am I complying with that regulation? However, what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to optimize my risk and return relationships. So I have certain programs. I can use open group to let me know that I am optimizing my risk return relationships subject to the fact 
that I meet certain compliance constraints, like having a minimum amount of regulatory capital. So they work together nicely, but they're separate. Okay, thank you. Anyone else with a comment? Otherwise, we'll uh, move on. Okay, well, let's. Uh, we talked about uh, the difference in definition of risk from the ISO 31000 standard. Um, question about another uh, another framework. How does Open Fair align with or differ from the NIST cybersecurity framework? Anyone uh, want to tackle that one? I'll start. Great, uh, Steve, if you like. Thank you, Mike. The, the NIST the NIST cybersecurity framework uh, describes the categorization and um, and some other things about technology and controls and, and a little bit about process in terms of in inventorying, identifying inventorying assets and, and such things. And it calls to do a risk analysis, but it doesn't say, and it, and it allows you or asks you or suggests that you make risk-based decisions, but it is silent on how you do that. And so FAIR and risk analysis fits uh, uh, gives some meat to the requirement or suggestion guidance that the NIST CSF gives that say that says make risk based decisions. But the, the more important point is that the two are separate and they're positioned this way. The board's obligation is effective risk management and risk governance. The means to that end are your security controls that allow you to govern risk to some kind of envelope that management is, has, is comfortable with. So security and the NIST CSF is the means to the end of effective risk management. Okay, that's a good sound bite, thank you. Yeah, um, just, just to complement, yes, I, like I think, yeah, I think that we can have this kind of uh, categorization because some kinds of controls can affect specific factors of the open fair, and so they can reduce the frequency or the magnitude depending which of the controls. And in general, not only NIST uh, CSF, but uh, also CIS and the ISO and the other standards, they are more focused on implement the control and uh, of course, one of the best practice or a control is to do a risk analysis, to, to take decisions, etc. But really, they, they are not specific how to do. Uh, so they is more uh, the what uh, than the, the how. And uh, I think that uh, in case of uh, qualitative or quantitative approach, we can have a, a big uh, uh, um, uh, tool to really to support the decision makers to select which of the controls of the NIST or whatever uh, framework that we can select uh, are, are with the better uh, relationships in terms of uh, uh, risk return. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, so the next one I know, um, Abs, you uh, you tackled this in the uh, in the chat a bit, but um, I think it's an interesting example. I'd like to to just go there again. Um, and uh, it, it's, I recently experienced a healthcare cyber outage from the patient perspective. A large healthcare provider in Southern California was massively impacted by ransomware, such that their x-ray systems and scheduling systems were inoperative for three weeks. Um, do you see risk, so it's a multi-part question, do you see risk management being taken more seriously in healthcare? Do you see open fair being adopted more? And are healthcare organizations really using a risk-based approach? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I'll kind of tackle those one at a time. You know, risk management has is various parts of risk management have, have been mature in healthcare for a long time, especially in on the clinical side, right? So, so there is there are departments, there are teams that do uh, regular reviews of issues and near misses and and all of that those kind of patient safety type of events. Uh, and and they're, and they're really good at it. So they've gone, you know, they've, got, they've gone pretty far down that path. In other functions and other silos, uh, departments of of 
of hospitals specifically, which is which is where my expertise is at. Uh, it, it's a lot more fragmented. It's a lot, in some cases, it's a lot, lot less mature. Lot less mature. Excuse me. Uh, you know, finance, for instance. Uh, you know, they're, they're building pro formas that aren't probabilistic. They're not looking at 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 at, at risk quantitatively, probabilistically. IT, it's a mixed bag. Uh, we have seen a a kind of a growing surge uh, of of interest and adoption of open fair and in, in by IT departments uh, and and other operational areas. So. Uh, you know, that that's it's a, you know, healthcare, you know, the, the anecdotally has always been 5 to 10 years behind other industry uh, in, in terms of adoption of, of process methodology and, and, and technology. Uh, and, and and I think kind of the same holds true with with open fair. But again, uh, there is definitely growing interest and, and there are some some leading organizations in, in, in the US at least that have adopted, uh, you know, fair and open fair and, and uh, are, are really kind of a, um, a center of excellence, if you will. Right, right. Thank you. Anyone else got any comments on the on the approach in healthcare? Um, if not, then let let me move to uh, let me move to the financial institutions. Um, we've obviously uh, Bob and Mike talked about those specifically. Um, how commonly do you see open fair being used in financial institutions and do you expect that to increase? Why don't you start Mike and I'll add a few words. Oh. So I think from, from my own personal experience, the best answer I can give is I, I don't know. I know I do know that some financial institutions have used open fair uh, and there are big banks that have used it. Uh, I didn't work personally with them. I just know of others who have. The impression I have from that is that they were driven by their IT organizations and not the risk group within the bank that is responsible for, for the things like compliance and the things that Bob and I talked about in our, in our presentation and in our paper. So I know it's being done to maybe make local decisions in in bank security organizations to justify certain uh, security control expenditures and the like. I don't know how it's going to move beyond that. And that's what Bob and I spent the last year really discussing and, and hashing out how that could happen. And Bob, maybe you'd amplify on that. Yeah, let, let me try to give some color here. So I was a chief risk officer and ran the treasury function at a couple of tier one banks. A lot of the risk management that takes place in those financial institutions are based on tools like Monte Carlo simulation. So we use Monte Carlo simulation to measure market risk. We use it to measure credit risk and so on. So the fact that FAIR is based on a Monte Carlo simulation approach and has the same sort of output statistics is a very valuable feature to integrate with the other pieces that we would otherwise use. I, as a chief risk officer, was not familiar with open fair until I really met Mike and Mike and I started having conversations ab about it. And then through those conversations realized the applicability to what would take place in a financial institution, a bank an insurance company and so on. So I think it holds a lot of promise in terms of how it might be rolled out and some of the vocabulary associated with it has to be harmonized with some of the bank vocabulary. I can't answer directly the question, how is it being used across you know, the banking community? But I, I could tell you, in, in, um, you know, I'm a co-founder of a, of a risk organization called Premier Professional Risk Management International Association. And 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 the kinds of tools that Premier talks about, and what I'm learning and now participating in the paper, you can see how it could be rolled out in a very nice integrated way if it was an exposed to the chief risk officer community. So I, maybe that's a long way of saying not clear what the direct answer is, but can see the promise uh, given right. what we're talking about today. I hope that works for you, Steve. <laughs> it does. Thank you, Bob. It does very much so. Um, 
Okay, we're nearly out of time, um, but I just want to take one question that cycles us back nicely um, to uh, what we were talking about before these sessions, which was zero trust. Um, so do you see any benefit from using open fair for implementing zero trust? And since you've been common to both John and Linford, I'm going to aim that one at you first. Perfect. Yeah, it's it's definitely an interesting an interesting point because the zero trust and open fair are sort of the two big streams in the security forum. Um, and there's no reason they don't play nicely. Right? Open fair is that risk analysis standard methodology framework that can help you make those decisions in implementing zero trust. If you don't know how or don't have a consistent way to manage and measure risk in your organization, it's going to be really hard to figure out okay, what data are the priority to try to secure? What assets do I secure first? Um, right? Where do I put these secured zones and what sort of controls do I put around them to manage my risk as effectively as possible while still allowing my business to make decisions and act quickly and stay relevant in market. Um, and especially as we see, right, an emphasis on automation and that kind of thing. And as we're seeing more and more open fair tools come around, in addition to, you know, the free one that the open group offers, there's a lot of promise for tie in around some sort of getting real time risk values using open fair to help you make those decisions in real time, which is really cool. Great. Thank you. Any other comments on use of open fair for zero trust? <laughs> if not, I think John said it well. John said it very well. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. Bob, did you have something? I, I can't hear you if you're speaking. Uh, no. no, except, no. Uh, I mean, I know we're coming to a close, but um, yeah. I have to say I've learned a lot from participating <laughs> in the open group process. And I've learned a lot just listening to my colleagues on the panel today. So it's a pleasure to participate. Oh, it's great to hear. And we, we, we're glad to have you. And uh, a, couple, a couple of quotes I want to share that that, that one of the uh, attendees put in the, put in the chat earlier. Um, open fair is a powerful weapon in the cyber, cyber risk war. Um, and I loved the course I did. And uh, open fair is perfect to quantify your HVA and your data tokens. So um, nice, uh, nice comments and uh, and endorsement of uh, of open fair. So we're going to leave it there, gentlemen. I very much appreciate your participation and um, and uh, hope that the uh, attendees have learned something too. And I'm sure they have from this session. So uh, thank each and every one of you for uh, for participating today, and uh, thank you all for the questions, folks. So. Thank you, our panelists. Wonderful job. Thank you. Thank you. So um, hang on in there, folks. We are we are done with that particular session. But um, before uh, before you uh, disappear, I do want to uh, uh, close up the uh, the event today. And uh, I like to thank again our sponsors, um, Biz Design, Lean IX, Mega, the Association of Enterprise Architects and Van Haren Publishing. So thank you again. Um, to those organizations. Um, we've had uh, a full day today, a very busy day, and, uh, and we're back tomorrow um, with a focus on digital standards. And uh, before we leave today, though, I do want to, uh, to introduce something that we're quite excited about at the Open Group and uh, actually includes um, some of the things we've been talking about today as well, and that is the Architects Toolkit. So um, those of you who visited our website recently will uh, hopefully have come across the Architects Toolkit. And I just want to give a bit of an introduction uh, about what that's all about. Um, we have many great standards at the Open Group and uh, many useful many useful tools for folks. Um, but uh, one of the ways in which they are more useful is if they actually work together um, and we can see the synergies between them. And that's really the concept behind the, the Architects Toolkit is Let's bring these various things together so that you have the right tool for the right job as you're uh, as you're doing your doing your work, whether that's uh, in connection with digital transformation activities or or something else. So we've uh, we've done some work and we'll continue to do some work on on pulling these together and showing you all how they work together and how useful they can be when when applied together. So we've got a um, a series that uh, is going to start after the, after this introduction 
uh, actually August the 3rd will be the the first of the uh, sessions on the toolkits and we're calling it toolkit Tuesday um, so uh, every other Tuesday uh, for quite some time now we're going to run it's going to be quite a long series um, some we're going to run some short um, uh, effectively broadcasts uh, that will be on the topic of the toolkit and there'll be some interviews over the over the course of the um series um some some presentations some interactive uh, activities so it, there's going to be a lot in there so so please look out for toolkit tuesdays and the architects toolkit and uh, as we play out today we will leave the chat running um, for you to connect with each other and give us any feedback you want to give and uh, and uh, we'll let the uh, got an introductory video, which uh, unfortunately for you all um, has me talking, but um, uh, it'll it'll introduce the the architects toolkit and what we're going to do with our toolkit Tuesdays. And we're we're really quite excited about it. There's going to be some great stuff. So look out for it, and we hope to have you uh, hope to have you back uh, watching those. And lastly. I'll just uh, conclude by thanking you all for your attendance and uh, we're, we're, we're back tomorrow, as I say, for those of you who can join, uh, we'd love to have you and I hope you've got uh, a lot out of today and uh, as I say, let's have some feedback in the chat if you can and uh, without further ado, we'll introduce the, uh, the Architects Toolkit. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining, be safe.